So there's lots of good and bad news involved in this. The, the good news is I'm a physical oceanographer. My training is in remote sensing. I'm talking about fish. That means I won't be saying scientific names because I can't. I did physics, so I wouldn't have to memorize names and I can't pronounce words over three syllables long. So that's the good news. The bad news is I've been doing it long enough that the biologists have taught me a few things. And so I can actually say them, but for the most part, I'm gonna to try to make this as uh, simple and enjoyable. And it's about fish, which is always fun. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about forage fish. And what's pictured here is an aerial view of different schools of forage fish that we can see in particular, what we would call sand lance up there against the beach and a little blue dot of herring down below. I'm presenting the work, but I have stole many of the slides from the biologists, including Yumi Aramitsu, Jenny Morella, and Joshua Zahner. So why should you care about forage fish? Well, the big thing is it's food for everything, just about everything eats these forage fish. They're that link between the zooplankton and the microscopic life in the ocean and the fish that you might want to catch. Plus, actually, some of them are pretty good eating themselves. The second reason you should care is these fish are found in shallow water quite often. And that means that they're likely to be in an area that would be exposed to an oil spill. You know, as that oil comes on the beach, and washes back and forth. These are the fish that are gonna be in that general area. So highly likely to get um, affected by that. Uh, in the everything eats them, you know, we have a whale coming up in the school of herring and people that were there to A, watch the whale, but also catch some herring as well. So what are they? There's actually lots of different forage fish. Uh, pictured here on the right, we have sand lance, herring, and capelin. Uh, you have juvenile salmon, uh, pollock, you know, any of the really small fish count. And also the large invertebrates. So you're, you, I'm gonna say a scientific word, you vousids, or better known as krill, you know, they're your, your big bugs in the ocean that whales and birds and other things like to eat as well. So anything in that kind of middle size, that's what we're gonna be looking at. So there's a lot of different techniques being used to monitor the forage fish populations. And so I'm gonna to just touch briefly on several of these. We've got Alaska Department of Fish and Game has been conducting herring surveys both aerially and with vessels for quite some time. There's an aerial forage fish survey that we've conducted for the last, well, since 2010. We've been looking at bird diets as a source of information on the fish. That goes back to the early 90s. And we also have vessel and acoustic trawl surveys. And a lot of this is being done through what's called the Herring Research and Monitoring Program or the Gulf Watch Alaska program. And these are uh, programs funded by the Exxon Valdez Oil Spill Trustee Council. And the pretty picture is what happens when millions of fish decide to have sex at the same time. Um, this is the northern tip of Kayak Island and it's a satellite image. You know, And that's one of the great things with the new satellites is if you do get that rare clear day, you can get some really fantastic images of the herring spawn going on. So I'm gonna start with talking about the aerial forage fish surveys. And this is something I've actually been involved with for quite some time. You know, I said remote sensing, my eyeballs I think count as remote sensors. So for me, this is up my alley. Uh, what we do is we fly the entire coastline of Prince William Sound in June. I mean, if you're in Cordova, you know, it's a really good time to give me a call because we often put a third person in the back seat to record for us. So it's a good way to see a, a large chunk of Prince William Sound. 
Um, we fly at a thousand feet. We identify the the schools that we see by species, we school size, and if we think it's herring, we try to age them. And this is from a thousand feet, and we're talking about fish that are a few inches long. And so the ones that we're going to see are the ones that like to school real tightly. So like the herring and the sand lance that we saw earlier, the capelin, ulicon, those are ones that we'll see things like salmon and pollock. There's no chance. You know, those fish just don't school tight enough for us to be able to, to see the juveniles. Majority of the fish that we're going to see are what we call age one herring. They're one year just celebrating their first birthday when we fly in June. So that's why we see most sand lance are probably the second most common. Adult herring uh, would be third. And occasionally we've seen capelin. And capelin have been pretty rare in Prince William Sound for the last several years. And I think it's actually true more golf wide. And I'll show you why. Now, most of you probably don't believe that we can fly at a thousand feet and identify schools of fish and then try to age them. So we put a boat down below us every once in a while and have them see how well we're doing. And so what's pictured here is the boat. This gray dot is a school, probably it looks like age one herring. And, you know, so the the plane, we're doing circles up above. We're trying to get the boat on top of them. You ever want to see uh, some people get real bored? It's a plane doing 120 miles an hour waiting for a boat. You know, come on. You know, it's right there. Can't you see them? And so we'll direct them on. They'll jig they'll do whatever else that they can to try to catch a fish and then they tell us what they they saw and oh if we call it herring 90 95 percent of the time we've been right if we call it sand lance it's more 75 to 85 percent of the time uh herring age we can do 75 to 90 percent correct um and, you know, these ranges are based on three different people interpreting the same data. And I will tell you, my interpretation all rides on the high end because I know that we should not be surveying in July. And the validation effort, they really wanted us to validate in July. And it was no, 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 because in July, the age zero herring, that year's herring, they metamorphose and they become visible from the air but they're not smart fish. They don't have the same behavioral habits. And so that makes them really hard. You know, age zero herring and age zero sand lance, they just haven't learned how to be themselves yet. And so that's the low end is when we include the age zero fish. And the other one that we deal with is what happens if it's a mixed age school? And they go, well, you know, we caught an age two. And it's, well, you also caught an age one. You know, who's who's right? And so my friends, they, they say I'm wrong. When I read the data, I say I'm right. And so I get the high end. So what do these surveys look like? What are we seeing out there? And this is a map from uh, this past year, 2023. The blue dots are age one herring. The green dots are adult herring. The yellow are sand lance, and we don't have any capelin that we saw this past year. The big thing in 2023, the numbers are moderate. You know, this isn't that, that big a, a year class out there. What was really strange is how many adult schools that we saw. We normally see a few adult school, schools, they're gonna be in deep water over here, maybe here, down Night Island Passage, but we don't see a lot of adult herring. And if you look, this is all green sitting over here. And these fish were on the beach. They were not in deep water. They look like they were ready to spawn. You know, which is really weird because spawning is typically April, you know, maybe the first few days of May, and we're flying June. 
And so this is into mid-June, we're seeing lots of adult fish sitting on the beach. So that was a really odd thing about uh, this past year. But what we'll do is we take all of these maps and then we try to look to see how persistent those fish schools are and what we can learn from them. So this first panel is the age one herring, the, the ones that we see the most. And if it's red, that means we see it every year in that area. Um, so the redder the colors, and this is around the herring spawning grounds. We see a lot of juvenile herring that are stay near the herring spawning grounds makes great sense. The other place we see a lot of, oh, that's what happens when you hit the wrong button. We'll get back. Oh. There we go, sorry. Um, the other place that we see them is down here in Night Island Passage, around Night Island, Naked Island. And it really makes sense that, to a physical oceanographer because these fish are larval for several weeks. That means they're just floating around, they're plankton, they're not swimming very well. So what ends up happening is that the circulation typically will pick up and go around the top of Night Island or Naked Island complex down Night Island Passage. And now that's the typical oceanographic circulation. So these fish, as their larvae are being carried down in and then they settle in Night Island Passage. So it makes great sense. Second panel is adult fish. Like I say, we don't see very many and there's very few hot spots that we see uh, south side of uh, Glacier Island being one of them. And the last panel, Sand Lance. And it's really Middle Ground Shoal and uh, the Naked Island Complex. Those are the areas that we most commonly see them. Although we'll see them pretty much anywhere. A lot of what, the reason why we're doing this was actually to look at the numbers of uh, age one herring schools, because we want to see if we can use it to predict what's going to be happening to the herring population. Uh, Fish and Game picks up herring at three years old when they join the spawning stock. And so that's when they start really surveying them, but they don't know what's coming down the road. And we're using this technique to try to give us that information. And so what we look and see is we had large numbers of schools in 2013, and this is the year of the observation. So it would be the 2012 year class with this graph, you always have to subtract one to get year class. 2013, 2017, 2021, 2022. Well, it turns out this year class was very large in Sitka and Kodiak and did not show up in Prince William Sound. Um, and it's been a mystery for us why it did really well elsewhere. The early indications was that it was gonna be good in Prince William Sound and it failed. This 2017 was the largest year class in the Gulf of Alaska that I have found a record for. It just was massive and it was everywhere. Uh, 2021, this year class is the three-year-olds that would be joining the spawning stock this year. So we're just going to learn about what's happening there. 2022, I actually think is an observation problem. It's strangely enough for Prince William Sound, it was super sunny in 2022. And so when we started flying, we saw Instead of hundreds of schools, we are seeing thousands at very small schools. So the behavior seemed to have completely changed because of that continuous sunshine. And once it did get back to normal weather, those schools disappeared and our numbers dropped back down. So, you know, I have to provide the numbers because this is how we do the technique. 
but I will admit that I don't trust them. You know, and the reason why we want to know recruitment is that's critical to understanding recovery. You know, for the last several decades, the recruitment has just been enough to overcome mortality. You know, we're having as many babies as the adults are dying, and that's pretty much it. You know, and if we want to build the population back up, we have to have these large recruitment events. Do I have a black button? <laughs> so airplanes are one way to see fish. The other way is to steal them from birds. Um, so there's a group that are out on Middleton Island that they, they steal the fish that uh, birds are bringing back to their nest and then try to figure out what exactly they're bringing back. And, and birds are really good samplers. They do have like anybody's tendency, if you have a really good berry patch, you're not gonna walk past it to the next place. Or if you like a nagoon better than you like a blueberry, you're gonna take a little bit more nagoons rather than blueberries. So they will bias. They are going to pick whatever fish is easiest. And that generally means you know, what fish is most numerous and what fish is closest to Middleton Island. Um, what's pictured here is the diet of an auklet uh, over since uh, 1993 to present. And there's herring, greenling, sablefish, salmon, capelin, Pacific sandlands. And what you'll see is they really like having capelin and sandlands because those are species that like to be around Middleton Island, but if they're not available, they'll pick on other things, um, but they'll also pick on things that are, are just prevalent. So if you've been out fishing for sablefish, you know that there's been this large year class that's come through or starting to come through. And that's what they're picking up. You know, when there's all these juvenile sable fish, they're gonna end up eating a lot more sable fish. But they not only know how, what type of fish, they measure the, the size of the fish. And for herring, that means that we can look to see how old that fish was likely to be. And here at Middleton, again, this has been shifted to the, the year class. So it's a 2012 year class, or, or they were 2013 for age ones, 2016 year class, 2020 year class, and they see a large bump up from the 22 year class, which I didn't see. But we're seeing that same four year cycle, both by the birds and the aerial observations we both saw lots of juvenile herring in the Prince William Sound area, Gulf of Alaska, from that 2012 year class. And again, they just did not show in Prince William Sound. And that's been one of our big mysteries. Now, we also use acoustics and, you know, identifying fish with acoustics can be done. It's not necessarily easy, but one of the things that's really easy to do is separate fish from uh, your large zooplankton, so your krill and other things. And so this is how we're starting to monitor how the krill population has been changing through time. And this is important because it distracts the whales and it keeps the whales off the things that we care about, which for me is the juvenile herring. So I'm a little on the bias side as far as what, what of my forage fish I prefer. Now, adult herring surveys. This is the stuff that Fish and Game has been doing. This is the stuff that opens a fishery or not. Um, What's pictured here is both the float, pain, float plane that we use for surveying the, the spawn 
and fishing games vessel, which we use for actually catching the fish themselves. The map, and I seriously doubt you're going to be able to see all the different colors, but that's going to be all right because I'm going to show you how to find that data yourself so that if you like learning about herring, I'm going to show you where some fun stuff is. Um, but this is this year's spawning map. It shows you where things occurred and on what day. Basically, the herring started spawning at Tetitlik and they ended spawning at Tetitlik. You know, it was a really good year around the, the village uh, as far as the duration and amount of spawn. Uh, the normal spawn areas, Hell's Hole, Knoll's Head area, receive spawn, you know, and then there's spots. Uh, like down here um, in the cutoff, a little spots in here, port edges around on Montague Island that were observed. Now, the other thing, oh, I sorry. One of the, what we do is we take all the aerial observations of the mild days of milt, how many miles of that milt we see each day and and chart it. And so what we can see is that this year, you know, it dropped a little bit. There had been this really nasty dip here. And here's back, this is 88. So, you know, back in the 80s when the, the population had built up. And you can see, you know, one of the nice things is this data set goes prior to 1980. So you can see the buildup of the, the population that occurred in the 80s. Uh, Kayak Island is not part of the Prince William Sound uh, normal area, but it has drawn a lot of attention recently because of real large spawning events out there. So they had 32 miles, over 32 miles of spawn this year. Prince William Sound had a little over 26 that we saw. Um, Fishing Game has started putting a lot more effort into understanding what's happening at Prince William's or at Kayak Island. And they're collecting the ASL data. They're collecting the mild day milk so that they can understand its ability to hold a fishery. And in fact, they provided a test fishery opportunity this spring um, that no one took advantage of. Um, so they, they're starting to, to look to see what the, the opportunities at, at really fairly small scales. We were talking, it was 150 tons in the fall. I don't remember what the spring was that they offered. They're also sampling, I showed you the vessel, they have the boat, uh, do seines at night to try to catch these fish. From that, they're gonna do things like figure out what the age is. And so the really large year class that has been going through the system are seven-year-olds this year. And what I was watching for is three-year-olds. And we saw a real mix of three and four-year-olds, which is a little particularly you know, unusual. We we're not thinking that the four-year-old class was that big. So why is the three-year-old class about the same size? And, you know, not fully sure. Another thing that we get is the weight and um, the length and a lot of other properties of the fish. You can see, you can see that if you hit the wrong button, you can go lots of places quickly. <laughs> um, it, no, this is, uh, I'll just go. We'll try hit it once. Um, you know, the important thing is that, you know, in about 2018, 19, the weight was really low on these fish. And what was happening is this is from the heat wave from 2014 to 16, which really changed productivity. And the older the fish is, the more it's going to try to put all of its energy into reproduction first and growth second. So you really see when the um, food is a stress in those older fish because, you know, they're they're just not going to grow because their priority is reproduction. 
I did want to mention the fish that's over there was supposed to be a reminder. So that fish was actually caught in late May over on the east side where I said there were a lot of adult fish that looked like they were getting ready to spawn. Um, you may or may not be able to see. Here's the, the eggs. That fish was mature. The biologist said it did not look like it was reabsorbing. It looked like it was getting ready to spawn. And we got two reports, one from Pigot Bay and one from uh, the Chiniga area of spawn that occurred late May, beginning of June. And this would be very characteristic of young fish. So we may have not seen all of our age three year class because they spawned really late and they spawned in an area that we were not expecting to find them. And so, you know, this June survey says that we may have missed a bunch of spawn. And of course, the weather this year was not favorable for remote sensing. You did not see through all those clouds. So here's the model estimate of the population. It shows you what happens through time. The model estimate, uh, the bottom dotted line is the thre uh, fisheries threshold. And the solid line is the probability that that uh, population is below the fishery threshold. And so what you see is that we're the last couple of years, we've been sitting just above the threshold. In fact, while I was at the dentist getting a uh, crown put in, he, you know, he goes, hey, what's what's this with the uh, the test fishery, you know, the food and bait fishery that you guys have opened? I don't work for fishing game, so it wasn't you guys. Um, but sure enough, I learned from my dentist that fishing game had open the opportunity for a test fishery for food and bait. And again, there was no activity on that test fishery. So, you know, they're starting to look at what opportunities might be out there. And it really seems to be more economic that's preventing a fishery um, from being executed. You know, SICK is not taking all of their fish. You know, there's uh, Togiak didn't fish this year, I think, um, the market has just been so poor that that's actually limiting um, in some ways. So to learn more, there's a few ways that you can learn more about what's going on. For those on Facebook, look up the Prince William Sound Herring Watch. I'd love to have you follow us. What we do is we feed as much of the information that we see um, so we're taking Fish and Games daily reports and we're uh, pushing those out. We're trying to provide as much information about what we see. Um, so it's a really good place. Fish and Game, remember when I said the map, you don't worry about being able to see it. If you go through the Fish and Game website and it is a little on the torturous side, so you start with the fishing game, then you find commercial fish, then you find Prince William Sound, then you find herring, and then you jump to the maps. And then at the bottom of that, there's an interactive map. And that interactive map will allow you to map every spawn event that they have ever observed. So you can do it year by year to watch how the spawn has changed, where is it going, you know, how much. So you can see it to your uh, the detail that you want to see it. And it's really worth doing the torturous route to find this data because it's a lot of fun to play with. The other place that you can learn a lot is from the Science Center's website, this uh, pwssc.org. If you look under research, there's a herring uh, section and it'll tell you about all the different herring research that's been going on for the last 15 years. So, that's a good place to learn more. But I don't want you just learning. I want you telling me things too. It was really important that I got that message on Facebook. There's herring spawn going on at Pigot Bay. 
that tells me a lot about what's going on. I can take that to fish and game. You know, if we have either of us have the resources to get out there to confirm things, it's great. You know, what we were seeing this year suggests the fish are going to do something different here. That's the problem with large year classes. They just change the rules. You know, there's not enough parents to control all the young fish. And so they go do weird things. And so now we need all the help that we can get. So Facebook, again, there's my email. The W is because my first name isn't Scott. It's actually William. So William Scott Pega at pwssc.org. Um, I'm sure Danielle can give you my email if you don't remember my name. Uh, definitely, I am looking for your help. So if you're out there and you're seeing things, I love to get information, any information you want to send. You know, I'm seeing a bunch of fish that are about four inches long. I like that. You know, that that tells me a lot. You know, it's OK. I know what you're looking at. And that helps me. And with that, I just want to thank uh, both the researchers from the Herring Research and Monitoring and Gulf Watch Alaska programs. Some of this work was funded by Prince William Sound RCAC and the aerial surveys. I appreciate their support for the years that we asked for it. Uh, the majority has been supported by the Exxon Valdez Oil Spill Trustee Council. And then there's the historic work that was conducted by Alaska Department of Fish and Game. And with that, I'll take questions. If you have biology questions, I'm going to say I'm a physical oceanographer. Hey, Scott. Yeah. So these big year classes and stuff, so do these herrings, I, I see like um, pink salmon, do they look out for new places? I mean, they're not totally migratory, but do they venture to pioneer no food or something? So what happens when you have... Traditionally, what we believe happens is that when the young fish join schools with the older fish, that they follow older fish into kind of traditional spawning areas. But when you have lots and lots of young fish, they don't always join the older fish. And so they just go everywhere trying to find new spawning areas. And so that's what will happen with a large year class is that you know, they, they just, there's not enough adults in the room and they take off everywhere. So, but I mean, they've, they've got to eat something too. Yeah. Is there food source? Oh yeah. The, the food's there for all of them. You know, there, the food's good for, for all the different fishes with the, the large year classes, you know, the 2016 year class, which I said was probably the largest ever in the Gulf of Alaska it looks like it was a combination of things. It was uh, warm water, actually turns out to be really good for very young herring because it led to smaller zooplankton, which meant that the food size was perfect for the juvenile herring. The warm temperatures allowed those herring to grow rapidly so that they were harder to for other fish to eat them. So it helped them avoid predation. So a lot of different things all came together uh, in the 2016 to create that really large year class. But there is enough food to hold uh, quite a bit bigger because the year classes that we saw in Prince William Sound recently are still only like a tenth of what was happening in the 80s. Um, and even uh, all the work that I've seen suggests that, yeah, we're not... Um, we're in, we're definitely not food limited. Uh, yeah. Hi, Scott. Yeah. My name is Paul. Hey, um, I don't know if I'm going to say this right. So we're looking to forage fish, and uh, there's so many, and we're looking at. My question is nutrient levels, the energetics yeah. of each one of the species. I don't know if you went that far, and if you really just want to center on one because there's five of them, and that might be difficult. Just yeah. krill. 
I mean, it's the basic unit, but it's the most numerous, I believe. Um, and you did mention a little bit about the size of krill. Yeah. So how about quantities of krill? How about the, the their abilities to to reproduce? How about the, the the amount of energy that they're they're holding? Are they I mean, is it is it a healthy system we're looking at? I mean, is this something that you can can talk about? I don't know. Well, I'm a fisherman, so you know. Yeah, krill is one that we haven't been monitoring long, so we don't have a real good feel for it. You know, when we monitor zooplankton, it's typically not using a system appropriate for krill. Um, you know, the typical oceanographic sampling nets, the krill can outswim. Um, so it's not a great sampling. The acoustics is much better, and we're just starting to get a, a feel for that. Energetics wise, herring, they're fat. You know, they're a really good source. Um, I'm trying to remember how they scale down as, as you go through, but if I remember right, herring was on the top. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Sandlands are don't have as good energetics. Um, you know, when you get to the right spot, they're in good enough numbers, and that's what makes them really good. Um, yeah, there's enough sport fishermen in here who know how good herring is as a bait. And, that you know, sand lance is not the only thing Chinooks would like to eat. No. 